Praise the Lord. Listen, I'm having so much fun. I get to do this twice every Sunday. I don't know about you guys, but it just gets a lot of fun for me personally. If I have a couple of preacher friends of mine think I'm out of my mind, but, but so does my wife. So what? <laughs> Come on, it's a joke, okay? It's, you seriously don't think about my mind most of the time. It is good to see you today. It is the Lord's Day. I'm glad that you're here to worship with us. And uh, just a quick word for those who got to go with us over to the Propel meeting in the uh, other side of town in Katy, where we went over to an associational Baptist meeting. A great time in the Lord. There are testimonies from missionaries that were there serving the Lord in South America. We had churches sharing what they were doing. They wanted uh, our church to come tell what we've been doing in missions, and then they asked me to follow it up with a message. We had a great time, great fun, great worship time. Had a church, uh, a group from Redeemer Church come with their band over and uh, been better if we took our own. But anyway, uh, it was really a blessed time in the Lord. And those who went, I know were blessed. We had papooses following the service. You ever eat papooses? That was my first papusa. It's not my last. That was pretty good stuff. I see signs everywhere, but now I know what I'm looking for. So uh, I recommend it. Just a little hot sauce on the side never hurts either, all right? But that was pretty good. We had a great time of fellowship, and the church was just so uh, kind to us as we went and were participating. It was good to be a part of it. Uh, there were a lot of pastors there, I think seven or eight pastors that were participating as well. I had three or four come up to me afterwards, specifically one that reminded me, you know, why we're here and what we're, what we're doing. He was, said, I'm in a church that's been declining for quite a time. And he said, uh, tonight's word that we shared about... Uh, the church needs to repent in regard to missions to get back after it. So that's the message for our church and my church. I'm going to take that back and share it because uh, I believe this, uh, this word tonight was from the Lord and for me. So it's amazing. Our church has been given so many opportunities to set, touch so many other places and so many other churches. You'd be excited about what the Lord's doing. Sometimes we get, you know, upset that we're not won't done in our midst at times that we forget all that the Lord is doing. So, you know. Let's take time to consider how blessed we are and what a blessing it is to be a blessing to others as well. Amen. So that was a great meeting of Propel. And uh, this is an association that uh, the elders will be talking about this week. Uh, perhaps it's a, some local missions, Baptist Missions Association that we'll probably be joining with in the future. So we'll be talking about in our elders meeting this week even. So we'll be sharing with that. At the end of the month, when we get to our, our annual business meeting. We'll talk about it some more to the church body. But God is good. Amen. So it was a great time in the Lord. We're on our series of messages called Thrive and not just Survive. And as we've talked to you about before, there's a lot of folks that are just surviving. And I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church, all right? There's a lot of folks who are just kind of getting through the Christianity, you know, and there's just not a lot of joy. And I've had, you know, people talk to me in, in recent days and weeks who come up to me and just shared the heart. You know, I'm really, I want to get back to that joy and that abundance. But remember, it's always a faith walk, but you've got to be walking in faith, all right? And let's be believing God and trusting God and always be venturing out with the Lord and trusting the Lord for more in our lives. And all too often, we just get caught in that rut and routine, the rote of things, and we're not really enjoying the abundant life that the Lord has promised us. But I want you to know there is a peace that passes all understanding. There really is. There is a joy that Jesus promised that is full of glory. The abundant life is not just religious rhetoric, evangelical jargon, all right? It's a reality. You can be full of the, the Lord. You can be filled with His Spirit. You can celebrate life and celebrate the joy that's in Jesus. Not that you're not going to have conflicts or difficulties or problems. I mean, sometimes it comes in like a flood, amen? But there is that constant in your heart and in your life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've talked about thriving and coming to that place. And it, obviously, that very first message dealt with that whole mindset of repentance and turning our heart and our thinking back to the Lord, where he, he's the one who fills our minds as well as our hearts and our lives daily. We keep him in the forefront of our lives. Last week, we talked, uh, we talked about giving. I want to continue with that this week, because I don't think we can thrive as long as we're centered on ourselves. Jesus called us to be disciples, right? Y'all know what that is? That's followers. There's a word in there that's kind of contained in the word disciple. We, we, we need to really remember it's called discipline. There needs to be disciplines in our life. 
Now, we don't live according to the law. We live under grace, but under grace, there's that glory that God has for our life that he wants to fill our lives with. But if we're just fo focused on others and focused on ourselves and getting our way, and we're just, I mean, we become self-centered. I mean, everything has to be the way I want it or tough. It's just me, you know. That's, that's, that's not giving. God's called us to a life of giving. And this is not just dealing with monetary issues. This is our lifestyle. We are givers, all right? We're serving Christ. We're disciples of Christ, and we're following the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to deal with a message that most of you, I would say, are familiar with. <clears throat> In fact, the particular series of messages, particular sermon today, is, I look back at my record, I think I preached it three or four times over 30 years, you know, that we, we've been here, 31 years, probably three times to four times. But it's a message that we all need to be reminded of, and I, and I say that because, one, as Christians, we always need to be reminded of our, our, our commitments and our call to Christ and our service for Christ and, the, you know, that we're living a life of surrender. But there are a lot of people coming to the Lord who either come into our church or that haven't been taught some of these things or they're new believers in Christ and they haven't been taught some of these things. And so we always want to be coming back to the basics. We want to come back to truths so that people learn these principles. So you may sit there, you know, may say, oh, I don't want to hear this again. I've heard this before. Hey, get over it, all right? We're not here just for you. <laughs> All right? This is not about just you. It's about you and the body and being your part and serving in your place, you know, and us working together. And we, we have people coming up in the Lord and growing in grace. Maybe they don't know these principles or it hadn't clicked yet. So, you know, let's, let's realize we're all in this together. Amen? So there may be times where Brother Gary says something you heard him say before. That's the way we learn, by repetition. So uh, I'm going to be repetitious and not apologize for it. Yes, let's get on board, and let's hear what the Lord has for us in regard to this. And this is about giving under grace. And I say that because I don't know where the Christian mindset is today. It's like we don't, we don't have anything to do with the Old Testament in our mindset. You know, that's the Old Covenant, or that's the Old, that's the old Testament, you know. And I'm in the New Testament, you know. It's got to be written in red. Hey, if you'd do one-tenth of the stuff written in red, we'd have revival. Amen. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's all about that. Now, listen, God's principles are true and, and, and they're solid and they're consistent. You know, God didn't give us the law to save us ever. You know, he said, well, that's under the law. You're going to talk about tithe, perhaps. That's under the law. Listen, God never gave us the Do you think that people in the Old Testament got saved by keeping the law? No, they didn't get saved by keeping the law. Bible says that Abraham was saved by faith. Moses lived by faith. Enoch walked by faith. They all lived by faith. And it's how we say it, by faith. Amen. Through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So even in the Old Testament, the New Testament makes it clear that even those people who were under the law, you know, they, they served by faith. In fact, there were those who weren't under the law that some of you think were under the law. Like Adam and Eve. They weren't under the law. Abraham wasn't under the law. Cain and Abel, they weren't under the law, you know. There's a lot to happen before the law was ever instituted. And so, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, if something had to do with the law and there was something written in the law, then, you know, I'm, I'm on, I don't know if I really want to deal with that. You know, I just think we're under grace. And they think that grace means you get to do whatever you want to do. Let people believe that, right? I'm under grace. And if I do sin, God, just forgive me. Still be Okay. The Bible says that the grace of God teaches us something, that we should deny ungodliness and selfishness, you know? In other words, the grace, if we're really under it, is working in our hearts and working in our life and transforming us into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our hearts are being changed. Our minds are being changed. Our lives are being changed because we're what? We're under grace. And that's not a, a banner. It's not a, like an emblem. The, here's the grace flag. I'm an American. I'm under the, the stars and stripes. No, grace is the active power of God working in us. All right, so it's God moving in his people and God working through his people. So let's, 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 we're going to try to correct some things in our thinking that may well be wrong this morning, all right? Have anybody ever been wrong? Listen, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, folks. There were a lot of things I preached in the early days of my Christianity. I tore those sermons up. <laughs> I'm surprised God didn't kill me. In my ignorance, right? I thought, oh, that was stupid. Why? You know, but... Truth, God has a way of teaching us and dealing with us and maturing us and growing us. But we always have to keep a teachable spirit. Now, the way we stay disciplined then is we always take what we're being taught, whether it's Pastor Joe or a lift leader or whoever, we always take what we're being taught and we hold it up to the Scriptures, right? Is this what the Bible says? 
That's why we always tell people whether they're in lift group or pastoring or coming to preach as a guest, you better stick to the word. You know, it's, it's about truth. It's about the Bible. What does the Bible say? Well, then they would say, well, you know, well, what if I feel led? If the Bible doesn't match what you're feeling led, you better, you're not being led. What does the Bible say? So we always go by, that's where you live a safe life, amen? Under the grace of God in the banner of God's mercies and grace. You go by what is written. You know, this is the mouth of God. God speaking to us. Does anybody else believe that besides me and Margaret? <laughs> amen. This is God's voice speaking to us. We pay attention. So we want to look at the Bible today. And I want to look at this topic that, 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 that people kind of just irk at, and that's, and, and even people who are benevolent giving people, they don't particularly like this word. It's, it's tithe. Tithe, all right? It, it's amazing as you study Scripture in the Gospels. We talked about last week, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over half the Gospels deal with stewardship and us being givers and living here and live abundantly by learning how to be givers in our life and realizing that we should be the Lord. You realize, we talked about last week, half, but specifically when you look at it, you know, that... Uh, in the scriptures, it's like 16 out of the 29 parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke deal with stewardship. So if Jesus had a lot to say about it, I probably ought to be preaching more about it than I actually do. Like this will be the second sermon and probably the final sermon this year I'll preach on this particular subject matter of giving. Jesus talked about it a whole lot more. And I think it's because if he can, if, I, if, we, if our hearts really his and our possessions are his, if my heart's not really his, then I'm going to quibble with him on my possessions, right? On what I give. So let, let's keep it in perspective. These are the things that, that the Lord teaches us, all right? One of six verses in, in, those, in, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke deal with, 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 with this issue of, of money, and what we would call mammon in the King James Version, but it's money. Here's the way it works in a typical church. And by the way, let me say right away, you guys are not the typical church. I don't know if you're typical to anything. Amen. <laughs> And I, I say that in a positive manner. You guys are a blessing. I can't tell you how many people come through this church, preachers and evangelists and others who said, that church is incredible. In their giving and the demonstration of their love and their attitude and the spirit of worship, that's just a, you know, I mean, Bill Stafford would use this church when he was in evangelism full time as an illustration wherever he went to preach. All right? I didn't tell you that because I didn't want to go to your head. <laughs> but just of, of people who give. And I knew that from experience, the average church I would go into and perhaps this size, you, you could expect that the giving for that week would be, you know, you know uh, maybe $1,500 in, in a love offering, maybe $2,000. Now, if God broke out in revival, it was always twice that or more. But just in the, if something, if people just staying where they were. This church would give away $7,000, $12,000, $13,000 in love offering to evangelists that have come through their years. That's just supernatural. So I'm going to show you some statistics and they don't reflect this church. In fact, I've never gone back and really ran all the numbers, but I know this, what I'm getting ready to share you, which is true for the typical church, isn't necessarily true for our church. It says in the average congregation, 25% of the congregation give 90% of the weekly offerings. That means that 25% give 90% of everything that comes in. And I know, I, that's, I know that's true from churches I've been through and gone through in, in, in my past life. Let's take that 25%. Within that 25%, the top 5% of that group, they give 90% or 50% of the church's income. The remaining 20% out of that group of 25, they give the other 40%. Isn't that incredible? 70% of the typical congregation in America contributes 5% of the incoming dollars. Now, between you and me, that's pretty pitiful. That's pitiful. Think about it. We're talking about Western churches and American churches. The church has been so blessed above all churches probably in the world. America has been blessed incredibly, supernaturally by God. We have been shown extreme mercy and favor as a nation from God. But how little appreciation we've actually shown. In fact, if you follow this through this and take it down to logical numbers, at the bottom line, it basically says that about three-fourths three of the American church attendees drop about a buck a week in the offering plate. That's their signal of appreciation. That's their sign that they've, you know, kind of like tipping God. Well, they'll give the waitress 15%, you know. 
uh, of the bill, but they'll give God a buck or two or five or ten, or they'll kind of look in their wallet and see what they can do. Now, it's not typical here. I believe that for the most part, many of you have caught the vision. You understand how things work. You, you've begun to, to buy into what the scriptures have to say about offerings and about giving and about, about supporting the kingdom and what God's called us to do and how we serve in the kingdom and give in the kingdom. Others are still learning. Others hadn't quite caught it. So I really want you, I, I know there's a tendency, you know, if we hadn't caught it sometime to tune preacher out when he talks about things like this. All right? So, so don't, don't tune me out this morning. Just, you know, have a, have a logical, biblical approach to this. Say, hey, what does the Bible have to say? I've been preaching about these kind of things for a long time, all right, 40 plus years. I've been studying the scriptures, preaching the word of God, and doing everything I possibly can to stay as true to the word of God. I have not taught you the word of God to get anything from you for myself. All right? And the Lord knows that, and I know that. And I have a clear conscience in regard to that. Nor have I taught you things to get you to do more so that the church could even do more. I want you to have a heart and a spirit that's right with the Lord, and you're just serving God, and you're just worshiping God, and you're finding your place and your part, your parcel in the body of Christ and in the kingdom of God so that you'll be honest and truthful yourself. So as we talk about these things, just, just have a teachable spirit in this moment. As I said, this may be repetitious for some of you, but it's a good reminder. L let me start with this point right here. We use this word tithe today. I'm going to explain it clearly, but I want to tell you what it is not. It's not a cuss word. It's not even four letters. It's five, and five is the number of grace, by the way, all right? In the thesaurus, if you look it up, it'll say, it's a tax. It, I only wish my taxes were 10%, Amen. <laughs> it's a duty. It's a church tax. It's an obligation. The truth is, tithe means 10. And then God speaks about the tithe. It's talking about a portion of everything you're blessed with, everything you've created because of the grace of God to give you the ability to create, all right, that you take 10% of that, a portion of that, and that's where you begin and I do believe it's just beginning. That's where you begin to honor the Lord with what he's honored you with and how he's blessed you. It's, it's, it's a starting place. It's, in fact, it's a worship action. I tell you the power of 10. The 10 comes up a lot in scriptures. Do you know that? I don't know how much you're familiar you are with biblical numerology. We say like five is the number of grace and eight is the number of a new beginning. Seven a, is, is a perfect number. 10 is the, is, it represents in biblical numerology the number of perfection, completeness, in divine order, all right. That this this is it, it. It has to do with completeness and perfection. And seven is a full number, yes. But ten goes beyond that. And, and let me show you just just from a little bit from the Bible about this number ten. There's a whole lot more. I'll give you a few illustrations because everything in scriptures is significant, all right, and is teachable to us. Ten in scripture shows up in the book of Genesis in the story of creation. You'll find the phrase and God said. You'll find that phrase ten times. So in the process of creating everything, there was this number 10. Later on in the scriptures, we find how many commandments? 10 commandments, all right? 10 commandments. Now, five of those commandments deal with our relationship to God. Five of those commandments deal with our relationship to humanity. Five, we said, is the number of grace. The only way we're going to relate to God and relate to each other is the grace of God, by the way. Amen? All right? But there were 10 commandments. Uh, I, I was reading in regard about this, the context of 10, and I, I was reading after a particular rabbi, and he was, he was talking about uh, this number 10. And he was dealing with how it relates to money and giving and things like that. And in this article, he said, listen, his name is Rabbi Daniel uh, Lapin, L-A-P-I-N. He said, the Hebrew word for money is the word kuf. We'd spell it K-U-F-F -F in English to translate it over from Hebrew to English. It's the word kuf. And it, it, it's a Hebrew word, not only for money, but it's also the Hebrew word for the palm of your hand. It's also the same word for the sole, or the palm of your foot, basically, the, the, the sole of your foot. And he explains it like this. He says, interesting enough, your fingers curve and bend towards what? The palm of your hand. And with these hands and the palm and your fingers, you create. 
You're industrious. You work. You, 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 you create income. You, you, you do your work and you create things. He says, so therefore, the palms are related to creation. God tells Israel, see, have I not, O Israel, do not hold you in the palms of my hands. His work, his creation. He said, but we also have ten toes. He said, but we have these, the sole of our feet, you know, is brought into balance by those ten toes. And he said, that represents movement and the transportation of things. He said, so in regard to Coof money and souls and palms, he said, we use our palms to create, we use our souls to carry our creation and our work to marketplace, and we offer and exchange value for things. He says, though, that's why the word is used in all three ways. But it, it's interesting to me that the Lord talks about tithe and 10% in regard to creation, but also to what we're doing and how he's blessed us with the ability to make and to create and to earn. So there's this concept you're gonna, that you see. Let me put it simply as I can. 10% tithe, if you want to use that word. Another word is proportional giving. We have this, 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 this picture throughout Scripture to, to do this, to give this way, because it represents that God always comes first in our life. With whatever I have created, whatever I've made, whatever I can do, I can only do it because of God, and so I acknowledge God in worship by giving that 10 back to him. So it's an interesting use of the word. But I think one of the greatest and most wise principles that we can teach the new believer in Christ and remind the older and maturing believer in Christ is let's, let's remember that faith without works is dead. And the work of faith is that we honor the Lord as he has blessed us. And that took place long before the tithe was ever brought forth in the mention of the law of the Old Testament. The kingdom-minded, the kingdom-minded believer, those people who are centered on the Lord Jesus Christ and his work and his kingdom, we know that the highest manifestation of love that we can exhibit is by giving. That's where it all breaks down. Giving my time, giving my talent, giving my treasures, honoring the Lord proportionally with how he, he has blessed me. Now, what does that take? Is that some rigid following of obligation and tax and duty? No, it's an act of worship on our part. We do this by faith because we believe God. Deuteronomy 8, 17, it is the Lord thy God that give us the, the ability to make wealth. Amen. Who gives me the ability to make wealth? Who gave you the ability to earn an income? Who gave you the ability to do it? God gave you that. You have the abilities that you have because they've been granted unto you. You just didn't get them. God gave you opportunity. God gave you advancement. God gave you learning. God gave you education. God gave you tools. God gave you equipment. God gave you a personality. All these things are from the Lord. Let me put it this way. If it wasn't for God, I'd have nothing. And we all need to acknowledge it. But I think that we do maybe in our head. But when it comes to translate it into actions of worship and actions of love, we certainly miss the mark all too often. My ideas, my so-called ingenuity, I sit back, might pat my back, myself on the back for something. That really came from God. That came through grace. It came through the hand of the Lord. I, I think I shared this story with you early on in the church, and I may have shared it since then, about the church. There was a church in the south, and they were a growing church, and they were situated right next to a grocery store. And uh, as the church began to grow, they ran out of parking for the church, and so they went to the grocery store owner and asked the manager, we noticed you're closed on Sunday. Uh, could we possibly use your parking lot on Sundays for our overflows? And the manager of the store wisely said, yeah, no problem. You can use it every Sunday except one. One Sunday out of the year, you don't get to use it. Well, why not, was the question. Because I want you to remember who it belongs to. <laughs> That's a good point. My giving reminds me where it all comes from. My giving to the Lord is certainly... Reminds me, it is the Lord my God who gave him the ability to do what I do. And by the way, can I say this? God's not poor. He doesn't need it. Amen. It's not about getting you to give him something. You know, God, God paves the street with gold. I think he's financed pretty well. Amen? Amen? We stock up gold and store it in vaults. He's paving streets with it. 
<laughs> God's got plenty. It's not the money he's after. It's our heart that he's after. But our hearts are so bound by selfishness and sin that it's hard to learn these simple lessons of responsibility and faithfulness to the Lord. Deuteronomy says it this way, Thou shalt eat before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose to place his name, and that portion, that 10% of your corn, 10% of the wine, and 10% of the oil, and of the firstlings of your herds, of your flocks, that you may learn to what? Why do we give? So we can learn to fear the Lord our God always. Now, if you're looking for a translation that says it's something different so you don't have to do it, you'll have a hard time. Let me show you what I mean. Here it is in the NIV. So you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Why do I give a portion? So I can learn to fear God always. Why do I get a well, new American standard? Maybe I'll find it out there. No. In order you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Well, let's look at something else. How about the King James? No, you, that thou mayest learn <laughs> to fear the Lord thy God always. Well, let's look to another translation. Living Bible is a little more liberal, isn't it? That the purpose of your first truth is to teach you to put God first in every situation. So you have it. What's the purpose behind it? Not to secure the tithe, but the tither. You see how that works? But it's really not about the, it's really about the Lord and my relationship to him and my worship to him and my gratitude and a thankful heart. Let me give you some quick principles. And again, this may be things you're well familiar with, but if you're not, listen, because it'll transform your very life. I really believe this as much as I'm standing here breathing air in front of you, all right? Fact one, the first fruits giving, tithing, if you want to call it, was instituted before the law of Moses. A lot of people say, well, I don't tithe because it's under the law. No. Yeah, there are, there is tithe mentioned in the law, but the first tithing is not the law. And apparently, God must have communicated this by revelation to Adam and to Eve, and they taught it to Cain and to Abel, and you see it in Scripture all the way down, you know, to, to Abraham, where he's tithing. You see, you see it in the garden, you see it here. Abraham gave to Melchizedek one-tenth. And by the way, if you ever do a study on Melchizedek, there's this great theological argument. Was Melchizedek a real high priest uh, of earthly origin, or was he just a pre-incarnated Jesus that was on the earth for a while? Because there's times in scriptures when you see Jesus show up, all right? When Joshua's getting ready and he's contemplating the battle of Jericho, this, there's this person who shows up and he calls himself, you know, the captain of the Lord of hosts. That's Jesus, all right? Before, some people think Jesus didn't come about till, the, till Bethlehem. No, Jesus has been from everlasting to everlasting, all right? He's been eternally one with the Father. And so some people believe that Melchizedek if, he, if he's not just a symbol of Jesus, he certainly is Jesus. The Bible says, you know, that he had no beginning, no end, the Scripture talks about. Some people, they just say, uh, some theologians say, they just, well, there's no record of when he was born and when he died. All right? It, it talks about it in Hebrews as well and in the Scriptures, how that, you know, that this, he was a type and a symbol, if nothing else. If not Jesus, he's a symbol of the Lord Jesus. And so what's he doing? He's presenting a grace offering to the Lord, if nothing else, to the high priest who presents it to the Lord. And then there's Jacob who promises the Lord in Genesis 28. This is well before the tithe ever existed in the, in the law, all right? He's presenting a portion, the first part of his, of his, his blessings and how the Lord prospers him back to the Lord, and he promises it in Genesis 28. And then there's the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. You see there, there, there's offerings that are being brought. And remember, this is only four chapters into you know, the Bible, right after creation, Adam and Eve have had their first children. They've sinned against God. They've been expelled from the garden, all right? And here they are. W what are they doing? Why are they making offerings? Where did that come from? Obviously, from a revelation from God that he expected offerings to be brought, all right? They're not just doing it. Hey, well, it's a good idea. Why don't we get something, you know? There's apparently some instruction, although we don't see it written out. We see them operating, is God would speak and give guidance and direction. They're operating according to something that they've learned or something that they've heard, and they're bringing these offerings. Let's, let's look at the story real briefly as we talk about it. In Genesis 4, the, these are the words that he gives. He says, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brings an offering of the Lord uh, of the fruit of the ground. And then Abel, uh, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and also not only that, he brought fat portions, all right? And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But he didn't have regard for Cain's offering. His offering had no regard for it. So what's Cain? He gets mad at God. God didn't bless his offering. Why didn't God bless his offering? He said, so Cain became angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said, Cain, why are you angry? In other words, 
It's like you knew what you're supposed to do. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. You know, it's not like you're not informed. <laughs> Why are you angry about this? Why are you can't? He said, if you do well, will not your countenance be left? If you do the right thing, you'll, 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 be, you'll be happy about it. But hey, if you do not well, sin's crouching at the door and the desires is for you, but you must master it. He said, you can't let selfishness rule your life, Cain. You know? You can't let selfishness rule your life. Now, the, some theologians will tell you this, and this is the way I believed early on in my Christianity. Well, God had regard to one offering over the other offering because he brings the, his calves and he brings a, a blood sacrifice, all right? And Cain... He doesn't bring a blood sacrifice. He brings a, 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 of his fruit and his crops. It's like a grain offering, all right? But why didn't God receive the offering, though? Well, understand, there's two kinds of offerings that are acceptable in Scripture. One is a grain offering. That's an acceptable offering to the Lord. Now, if there's an offering for sin, it had to be the other kind of a sacrificial blood offering, all right? That was like the sin offering under the law. But either, either of these offerings are acceptable unto God. So why is God not regarding this grain offering that, can, that, that, that he's bringing to the Lord. Well, why is he rejecting it? Well, it seems to me if you follow the story carefully, Cain just brings the fruit of his offering, not the first fruits. That's that proportional giving, not, the, not, the, not off the top, not a portion from the top. Abel brings the first fruits. Well, he also brought even more. He brought the fattest. He brought the best of what he had to offer. I don't get paid in goats and cows. Do you? I don't get paid in corn and grain. But I do get paid in dollars. So what's the first part of my offering then? Well, it means I'm going to give to the Lord before anybody else gets anything. That's the first portion. Before Uncle Sam takes a shot at me, before Social Security gets a shot at you, before anybody else, the Lord is first in my giving. And some of you learned the value of this lesson, you learned, and you're, you're reaping the benefits of this lesson, but there's a lot of folks who still haven't got it. They're, well, Brother Joe, should I tithe off my ta uh, uh, before taxes or after taxes? How do you want to be blessed? <laughs> I want to be blessed bigger than littler, amen? Not on the lesser portion. I want to honor the Lord first fruits. And so you see this, this offering. Well, how did Cain and Abel, what are they, what's the Lord talking about? You should, you should know better. Listen to Hebrews chapter 11. It gives a little insight here. It says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain, in which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So what does the Lord say in the New Testament about this Old Testament? God, God, was, God was telling us in the New Testament, all your offerings are faith issues. They're not law issues. It's not a matter of law. It's a matter of faith. It's not a matter of commandments and mosaic laws and rituals. It's a matter of faith. It's an act of worship. And one brother just kind of trying to meet the need and kind of do to satisfy that this will be enough to get by. This is what I think I will can afford. I may have to put a little aside but, and, and keep it from the Lord because you never know what might happen next year. What are you saying? You're saying, I don't, I'm not trusting God for next year. I'm not trusting God for next month. I'm not trusting God for next week. I'm going to do what I think. There's no faith there. So understand, before the law, how are they giving? They're giving by faith. It's faith giving. And what is that? It's worship giving. And by the way, I don't know if you understand or not. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? There must have been some revelation given to Adam and Eve that they're transferring to their families and those coming on down about giving and worship and having faith in God and demonstrating that you do really do have faith in God. By faith, Abel, you offered a better offering. Cain did not. Abel acts in faith. Now, let me give you another translation of this, this verse in Genesis, you know, 4, 6 through 7 that we read a while ago. There's a, there's a translation of Scripture called the Septuagint. You've heard maybe the Septuagint Bible. Say, the Septuagint says, well, what that is, the Septuagint Bible is, is, it's a, they took the Hebrew, which the original text is, and 200 years before Jesus was born, they translate the Hebrew into Greek, all right? And the Septuagint is the Greek translation. Now, let's take that and kind of put that translation into English. It would read like this. By the way, uh, let me come back to that. When it says more, uh, better offering, it's pleonthusiasm, and it's a word when it says a more excellent offering. It's not a word that talks about quality. God wasn't saying your fat offering and your beef offering is better than a grain offering. That word in the Greek language has to do with quantity. Let that sink in a little bit. He didn't bring the right amount. 
Here's the way the Septuagint Bible puts that verse. Genesis 4, why are you become so sorrowful? Remember? And why is your countenance fallen? Hast thou not sinned as thou hast not brought it rightly and not rightly divided it? Not that you should bring an offering, but you didn't divide it right. You, you didn't take the portion correctly. You brought what you wanted to bring. You didn't bring something that would give an evidence, you know, that you're honoring me and that I'm God and I'm your provider and I'm the one who, who meets the needs of your life. You haven't rightly divided it. So Cain's sin, catch this, Cain's sin was not in bringing the offering to the Lord, it's just not in bringing the right amount, bringing the right portion, all right? Which is what? First fruits. What are first fruits? Tithe, ten. That which we, through our industry, through our work, and through our labors, we produce. That we create, and we honor the Lord. We tend, we take our ten fingers and take ten percent, and we give it to the Lord. And we honor. We take our ten toes and take it up to the house of God and we present it to the Lord. So we see that there's this issue of, of faith here. Now, this is not something that Brother Joe just kind of came up by himself, this basic concept of Cain and Abel's issue. This goes way, all the way back to the first century, to first, second, third century church, fourth century. All those early church pastors and disciples and fathers who wrote down much after the disciples are writing scriptures, they're writing commentary a lot on what they've been taught from the apostles. And they have different concept of what today, when people say, well, that deal with Cain and Abel, that's just about meat offering, blood offering versus grain offering, and God doesn't accept that offering, because God does. And they said it's because it wasn't a blood offering. These first century fathers put it this way. The Clement of Rome he wrote this in the very first century. Remember, these are the guys being discipled by the disciples, first disciples. He said, Cain's sin was not in bringing his first fruits. He didn't bring the right portion. Arrhenius, the second century pastor, he said, he said, Abel brought tithe of a flock. Cain did not bring a tenth of his crop. Interesting. Hillary, the bishop of Port Sears in the fourth century, he maintained this whole idea. He said the tithe must have been somehow a concept begun in Eden. Hugo Abbott St. Victor's and also Peter Comstar in the 12th century both said God had respect toward Abel's offering because it was a portion, the right portion, a tithe, a 10%. So when people say, well, it's under the law, that's not, that's not right. There is tithing in the law, all right? But as long as time has existed, from if we study Scripture, listen, listen carefully. God has reserved for himself in regard to our time, one-seventh. God rested on the seventh day. He shows himself that there's a day of the seven, a portion that belongs to the Lord. What portion of the, well, we know our life belongs to the Lord, our time belongs to the Lord. The Lord wants us to honor him one day of the week. That's why the early church worshiped on Sunday because it was the day of the resurrection. So that's the day they chose to set that day aside. We'll honor the Lord. This will be our week. This is, where, this is our tithe, so to say, that portion of this week. The first fruit of this week is Sunday. You're today, by you being here, or showing the Lord you love him, you respect him, you honor him, and you're dedicating this day. You could be doing something else. You could be like so many others are. You know, you could be at the soccer field, the golf course, wherever it might be, you know, down at the store buying all the beer you can for Super Bowl. Amen? You realize that they'll sell $10 billion worth of beer this weekend? I think Trump only wants half of that for a wall. <laughs> Get it from the beer drinkers, amen. <laughs> I'm to send that up to Washington. I'm sure they'll appreciate that, amen. But, it, but not only time, but what about our treasures, the things that God gives us with, you know? It's, 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 he's prepared a portion for himself. Now, if you look at tithing in the law, let's look at that for a second. Moses instituted, first tithe was in everybody's mind already. They didn't do that. He instituted two other tithes, a second tithe and a, and a third tithe. The second tithe was instituted in Deuteronomy 12 for the feast, several feasts, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Pentecost. That's what that tithe. And the third tithe that was instituted had to do with the widows and the poor. It was almsgiving for strangers and the fatherless. That was, that was for them. So you say, all right, I'm just going to give according to the Old Testament. Then you give up about 33 and a third percent before you leave today because that's about what it came up to is a chunk of change. And, you know, everybody's going to put a little extra in for themselves. 
But the law was given us to show us that we, can't, we don't honor God anyway. The law was given us to show us our failures. The law was given us to show us that God's righteous and we're not righteous. So we're living, praise God, under grace. But God's got us in this attitude, you know, of grace living and grace giving that should be a life of abundance, amen? We honor the Lord with our time. We honor the Lord with our treasures. We bless the Lord. Jesus fulfilled the law. We know in Galatians it tells us that he came and, you know, the law was added till the seed come. And obviously scripture teaches the seed, the seed of Abraham, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But the first time, that about worship and that portion which belongs to the Lord, like our time as well as our treasures, that's still in effect. That's not under the law of God. You know, Jesus came to fulfill the law. By the way, did Jesus tithe? Anybody got an answer for that? Yeah, you bet he did. He said he, he, he fulfilled the law in every port and portion, every part. He came and fulfilled every aspect of the law. That's amazing. But not only Jesus tithed, he gave to the poor. All right? Jesus, you know, he gives. But remember, I believe this first mindset, this first lesson that God teaches about the fact that he owns all and we, everything comes from him and our life belongs to him, we just honor him by, by giving those first fruits. I mean, murder is under the law, right? But since the law's been fulfilled and Jesus settled the law and we're under grace now, does that mean I can go murder somebody? No. In fact, under grace this under grace i can't murder them even i have to love them i have to love my enemies hello but let me tell you what jesus says to the people who are really under grace that's you and i for saved and christians right if you're not right with your brother and you're not loving your brother that's you're guilty of murder maybe you want to go back to the law <laughs> grace always takes us further amen grace always requires more in our lives the bible says grace teaches us that we're denying ourselves and denying our ungodliness but if something was wrong at the law and before hey it's still wrong today it's still wrong to commit adultery it's still wrong to commit fornication it's still all those things are still wrong it's still sin right how can you say, I'm under grace, which are, no, well, you think I'm under grace, I can go live like an adulterer and confess my sin later. You're probably not even under grace. You're under delusion. We're under grace. God's forgiven us. But there's this tithing, this proportional first fruits giving before the law, during the law, after the law. It was kept. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus looked at the Pharisees and they're, talking, they're saying, we tithe and we give to the poor and we fast. And, and he said, well, that's great. You should do all those things. So if you're looking for something in red letters, Jesus said it. You should do all those things. That's what he said. Don't get mad at me. You should do those things. He said, but the problem with you guys is you left the weightier matters undone. The matters of forgiveness, the matters of love, the matters of mercy. You're arrogant, you're selfish, you're self-centered, you're judgmental. Everything's got to be your way or the highway. And you clothe it all in religious hypocrisy. He said, you're like dead men. He said, you're like, a, like serpents living in tomb. I mean, he was not so easy on these guys. But they were certainly good according to their standards that they had put out for themselves. What did Jesus tell us? Jesus tells us, you know, very simply, well, I don't even have it up here. You render, Matthew twenty two twenty one, you render unto Caesar the things that are whose? Some of y'all have a problem with that because right? your employer takes it right out. You render unto God, it goes on to say, the things that are God's. Why do we have such trouble with that? We just render to the Lord the things that belong to the Lord. And obviously, I think this is the way we manifest our love and our mercy to him. And we bring it to the storehouse. We bring it to the kingdom work to do what God's will is. Now, the next couple of points are real fast, all right? So listen carefully. So first, first, first fruits giving is not Mosaic law. First fruits giving, tithing, teaches us the meaning of what it really means to be a steward of Christ. We talked about some of this last week, so I don't have to labor long here, all right? That the, the tithe is holy unto the Lord, the Scripture tells us. This is, this is what the Word says. It's, a, it's what the Lord has called us to do, to, again, to demonstrate our love. It's, by the way, it's never mine. It's like some of us are writing out a check for even a tithe or even more. It's not mine to give. It's God's, all right? Do you, do you not get that yet? Do you not understand that what you've put in your hand, it's never ours? It's really just ours to manage, 
according to how management wants me to manage it. Jesus is Lord, right? Y'all know what the common 21st century vernacular for that is? He's boss, all right? He's the boss, and everything belongs to him. He's my boss. Now, he lets me be the sub-boss, the associate manager, but I manage as an associate according to what headquarters, the district office, which is the kingdom of God, tells me to do with it. How does God want me to handle what he's given me? So it's never mine. It's his. And you can't give it because it already belongs to him. You're just responding in faith and surrendering what is his to show that you truly love him. You offer it as a sacrifice. The third point of the fact I want to show you is about first fruits giving. It is the gateway to, to true blessings of God. All right? It's the way we experience the true blessings of God in our life. It opens the door. Malachi said it opens the windows of heaven. All right? So we experience God. We know that it's not supposed to be an obligation if we study Scripture. It's not an obligation. It's a blessing. Why? Because it's worship. I get to worship God. I have something now to offer. There's nothing more miserable uh, than, than knowing you want to give something to somebody or to something and, and not have anything to give. I mean, that's just, we, I don't like that feeling. The Bible tells us it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. All right? But what it is, you know, it's just something when you want to do something, you hadn't been able to do something, you haven't been in one of those places in life, you just really, you know, but you just didn't have it. But God gives us, and that's what he asks of us. And it becomes a blessing. And it is this proportional offering that we do. And as we do it, we're honored by the Lord. Malachi says it's proving God, he's our father. All right? It, it proves the fact that we belong to God. It opens up the windows of heaven. Jesus said in Luke 6, when you give, it will be given back to you. Proverbs says, cast your bread upon the water. Many days it will come back to you. In fact, God says, if you do this, I'll make sure that Satan doesn't get a hold of what you do have and destroy it. Because Satan definitely knows how to take your money. Can I get a witness? Amen. Stop it, devil. How do you stop it? He said, just be faithful to God. One thing he told the people in Malachi, he says, when you do this and you honor me this way, I will cause you to be blessed among the nations and the nations will call you blessed and they will know that I'm your God. I'll be glorified through your life. I will show you off to the world around you how I can meet your needs. He said, you will be a delightsome land, a strong land. You'll be a positive attraction to the people around you when you learn how to not be selfish. You know, people in life are never memorialized or honored. I watched a little bit of the NFL honors on TV last night, and they got to the Walter Payton Award, you remember? And, you know, and, and we're for benevolent works and acts of kindness. You know, they didn't award that to people who don't give anything. In fact, people who don't give anything don't understand there ain't no remembering them. There's no awarding them. There's no blessing them. It's the people who give. And it doesn't have to be recognized by the world or the NFL. Don't just recognize by Jesus. That is all that matters. But if I don't obey the Lord, understand, it costs me more if I disobey. You say, well, you, you know, Malachi said you're cursed. Are you saying that God's going to curse me if I don't give a tithe? No. The curse has been settled at the cross of Jesus Christ. But hey, if you step into a quicksand, volitionally, willfully, you're going down. You know? If you act in ways that are irresponsible and unreasonable, there's always a prime. We teach our children this bad choices lead you to bad places. You gonna blame God when you get to the bad place? You can. But the same thing Cain tried to do. He's mad at God. Cain need to be mad at himself. Sin's crouching at the door and desires to be your master. <laughs> All the time we get in trouble and we say, well, oh, God, treat me. God doesn't love me. You did this. You remember the story in, in the book of Joshua when Joshua is, is ready to lead the troops in the land and God comes and he speaks to him. And he says, listen, when you go into Jericho and you conquer it, leave it. Don't take the spoils. Don't take anything. Don't, the, 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 the livestock, nothing. don't take anything with you. Now, why would God do that? God went on to say, now, the rest of the land is yours because Jericho represented a tithe. It represented a portion. You understand that? He said, he said that belongs to the Lord. There's a, there's a Hebrew word. I can't think about it, but it basically means accursed. And, and it translated in English, do not touch the accursed thing. In other words, there's things that just have a curse on it, and it's judged. Stay away from it. Disobedience is cursed. All right? Stay away from it. It's like over there in that wall socket, there's 110 volts. 
if I stick my finger in it, I'm going to know about it. And I'm going to pay a price for it. And God's saying, hey, there's some things, keep your finger out of it. Keep yourself away from it. Do what's right. Honor the Lord. Obey the Lord. Worship God. Do what's, what, what honors him in your life. And so what's happened? Achan goes in there. It's a proper name for him because he was Achan later. All right. He goes in there. He takes the, 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 the clothing and the gold, and he can't do anything with it. Talk about this is just selfish humanity. This is so picturesque of what we are when we're left to ourselves. He goes and he hides it in his tent like he's really got something. Amen. Well, in trouble, it's, there's no blessing on it. It is the accursed thing. If I take an accursed thing, that which doesn't belong to me, then I have to pay a price for that. Oh, I, I, God will forgive me. But I'll tell you one thing. There's not any pleasure in it here now, and there won't be any pleasure in God when I stand before him and give an account of my life before the Lord as a Christian and what I did with what he, what he blessed me with and what he gave me. And be assured that I will stand before God on all these things. So I want to walk in blessings. I want to walk in the grace of God, amen? So I, want to, I, I don't want to touch the cursed thing like in Jericho. I want to move forward and realize, hey, my life belongs to the Lord. He's asked this of me. I'll do this graciously and willfully and as an act of worship. And the last point is, is I want to make to you is that this first fruits giving, it's really just the beginning point in our giving. And I, I didn't preach this a lot in the early days of our church, mentioning tithe a lot for those who've been here for a long period of time. I just talked about giving in general. Because this really, folks, this is the beginning point. This is where we just step on and we start learning how to give. Tithing is only one of the types of giving mentioned in Scripture. There's almsgiving, all different kinds of giving. Giving to the widows, giving to the poor, giving to help people. But hey, he says, you, you bring your tithe to the storehouse. But there are also alms offerings and things like that. We give. Kathy and I, we, we give. You give. But we want to make sure that the first portion that we give obviously goes, Lord. We've decided in our personal financial world that we'll give more than 10%. And God's blessed us for doing that. Church is not the only We also give to some charities here and there and needs. We, we give to situations where there are people in desperate need. We give to people who are suffering in, in some regard. As God brings, not, I don't try to give to every person I see. The Lord has a way of speaking to my heart. But that part, that revelation given is far above the first revelation. First revelation is a tithe belongs to the Lord. This goes beyond that. And God meets you there. God blesses you there. I mean, I'm sure, and I know because I've talked to many of you as we've talked about these issues, that you could come up here, and maybe we'll do this one Sunday later. Let guys just come up, or women come up to how they gave something to the Lord, and how God blessed it. What they gave the Lord, how, and, 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 because this is one of those areas that you can really mark it down. Here's, what, here's how God met my name. I gave that, he gave me this. You know? I, I, there's times in our life and in our family where we didn't have much of anything, really. I mean, we were poor and happy. All right? And we'd say, I don't know how we're going to meet this need that's coming up in this next week or this next month. And our, the result of our praying and talking about it, we always went back to this. What do we have to give? What can we give? What can we give? Because God honors giving. You can't get around the fact. Given it shall be given unto you. But this first fruit, it's the beginning place, all right? And it, it actually, at this point, that's where we're starting to partner with God in the kingdom, what he's doing in, in, the, in, the, in the church, in the body of Christ. The purpose of first fruits giving, though, is not to get your tithe, but you, to get your heart where it's not consumed with greed. Because this is a greedy little world we're living in. I mean, how many of us sitting here today think, if I just had more, I'd be happier? You won't. You give more, you'll be happier. How do you believe that? Because I believe with all my heart and have affirmed it multiple times over that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. I didn't write that. God wrote that. The very Son of God gave us that word. It is more blessed for you to give it away than to keep it all. Amen. If we miss that, we'll never thrive. You say, what are you talking about? You're talking about abundant life and abundant joy and abundant spirit-filled living. You can't experience it if you're wrapped up in yourself. You say, well, I'm a self-made man. I've discovered that most self-made men worship their creator themselves if they think they actually created themselves. Someone said, the person who's wrapped up in himself comprises about the smallest package known to man. Ain't that the truth? It's first fruits giving. It's worship. It's faith. It's honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me wrap it up with a warning. 
If you're just doing this to get the praise of men, or you feel like you're obligated, it's that church tax mindset you have, you know, are you afraid of God thumping you upside the head? I don't expect much. That's not worship. You turn this to an act of worship. Present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's your reasonable service of worship. You just say, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to honor God. You know the story in, the, in, 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 in Jesus in the Gospels when he, he says he's standing over against the treasury. What's that mean? In our, in our church today, well, that would mean that Jesus is standing back there where Dennis Conn is seated or over by one of these other offering boxes. All right? He was at the temple, and he chose at the temple today to go over where the offering boxes were. That's why we have offering boxes and we don't pass a plate because we want it to be not somebody sticking something on your nose and it's time for you to give. But if you willfully, volitionally of a heart that loves Jesus as an act of worship, place your gifts in the offering boxes. We ought to call them the worship boxes, amen? Put them in the worship boxes. And he's standing there and it says he's watching what people put in. Well, none of his business. He just happens to own everything they're putting in there to start with. He's God. It's absolutely his business. And if he's looking then, he's probably looking now. And he's watching his people come in, and they. I'm not taking this out of context, okay? This is the context. And he's watching what people are putting in, and here comes this precious widow lady. She puts in this coin. And it says she gave out of her need. What does that mean? That's what I was talking about a while ago. Kathy said, we have a need coming up. What are we going to do about it? I mean, tithing probably wasn't going to meet her need. This coin wasn't a portion. It was pretty much a chunk of everything she owned. And Jesus was marveled. He said, that's worship. He said, she's put in more than everybody. Excuse me, that Pharisee just put in 100 coins. That lady put in 50 coins. That guy put in 10. She put in one coin. What do you mean? He's talking about faith. He's talking about worship. And he's talking about proportion. Her proportion to what she had was larger than anybody else's portion. So she gave more. We've all been given portions, Right? You know, your tithe may be more than my tithe, may be less than my tithe. I just need to do what God wants me to do and be faithful to what God wants me to do and see what he does. It's worship and it's faith. And if you move to a life of living, say, I want to live a life of worship. I want to live a life of faith. Guess what God's doing? He's going to pour that back on you. It's the kind of people he's just looking to bless and to meet their needs. You know, 10% is just the starting point. The Bible says we give to prove in the New Testament the sincerity of our love. So what do we want to do? We want to learn to trust, translate the love that's in my heart, the emotions that I'm feeling in my heart and spirit. It's a tangible expression. The wife says to her husband, if you love me, why, why do you treat me that way? Or husband says to his wife, if you love me, why do you act that way? Why? Because we all know that love has tangible expressions, right? Do we love the Lord? Well, you know, I don't really give to the Lord, but, you know, I'm in a church. Well, and you're giving your time. Well, you know, I don't really give to the Lord, but I serve, I play in the band, or, you know, I teach a Bible study, or, you know, I'm, I'm an elder, or I'm a deacon. Listen, if you're an elder or deacon, you have expressed to those leaders that you're a tither to start with. That's in the materials when you become a deacon, when you become an elder. That's an expectation upon you that you've agreed to. You know, I'm not looking at your giving records. I'm trusting that you're an honest person when you say those things. Amen? So, but what is it? It's an expression that you love God. And I'm a faithful person to the Lord. And if I can't be trusted with the little, Jesus said, money things, how can I be trusted with true spiritual riches? This will transform your life. This will transform your, transform your economy. Your personal economy can change. And you can live a bigger and a broader life and a more impactful life in the world around you. And it hadn't got to do with how much you got, it's how faithful you are with what you do have. But if you've been transgressed in, in any area, the Lord doesn't bless our lives. We have to serve God, not ourselves. We serve God, not our money. We serve God, not this economy. I serve God. doesn't matter what the economy does. Amen? So I'm just going to serve the Lord. I mean, how many people like Cain, they come to church and they put in the offering just whatever they want to put in. Instead of coming like Abel, who by faith, who by faith did what God wanted him to do. He said, well, look what got him. He got killed. No, he, he graduated. 
far better cry to be in the streets of gold, in the presence of God himself, and be even in the early days of creation on planet Earth. No comparison. God always, always, always takes care of us. But we need to learn how to respond faithfully as children of God. So I don't know where you are. Actually, I think for the most part, our church is unique in that there are probably more those people who've learned how to give like that than those who haven't. But at the same time, I know that times come and go financially for us that people want to cut back. The last thing you need to do is cut back on your giving. I remember speaking to a man in, in, in South Houston one time. I was there and, uh, at a church. In fact, Kathy served as a secretary at that church, and I was in evangelism. And uh, he was complaining to me. He was the treasurer of the church about how, how difficult things were for the church financially. And I said, well, what are you doing about it? He said, well, we're going to cut back on our missions giving. I said, well, honestly, I said, that's, that's ridiculous. Why would you cut back on your giving? Well, because it's not there. I said, but the way to keep it there or to get it to come in, according to Scripture, is by giving. Giving it shall be given to you. You know what his response was? Purely logical. Come on. That's just selfish. Giving so I can get. I said, I didn't say it. Jesus did. But it's not just giving so I can get. It's giving so you can keep doing the mission, keep doing the service, keep doing the worship, keep meeting people, keep seeing needs met, keep seeing people's lives change. We don't, we don't cut, if I'm going to cut back something, I'm going to cut back my salary before I cut back missions. I'll cut back Gary's salary before we cut missions, if not mine. <laughs> We don't cut missions, amen. amen. What we do for the Lord. Because it's in giving that keeps it coming. And we keep honoring the Lord. So let's learn that lesson, simple lesson. Don't, you know, don't be tight with God. He's not tight with you. He's just waiting to, to do something in our lives. And it's a tangible thing that you can literally track. I mean, you can get on Quicken and track it. You know, I gave this much. Here's where my income is. I'm going to continue to be faithful here and see what God does. And we'll give a little more, and I guess a little more. And we'll give some more, and get some more. That's just, the, and it's not the nature of so I can get it. I, I, I think one of the great Bill Stafford quotes was, you know, God wants you to be his warehouse of distribution. God can store it here and distribute it where he wants. And I'm just being a good steward of it, where you want it. Hallelujah. And that's the kind of life we live. That's the kind of life that brings about thriving. Hallelujah. You want to thrive, not survive? You can't, you can't skip this part of your service to the Lord. You can't skip this part. It's a valuable lesson for all of us to learn. So I hope you receive it and have a teachable spirit. I don't apologize. You know, I talk to preachers all the time. Well, I don't really preach about that because people just vent. They just get so mad. I said, you preach or don't preach something based upon what the people say? Because that's a dangerous way to live in your ministry. You know? Well, I just, you know, if they won't like it, hey, They'll get over it. They'll go and gripe about you at lunch, you know, and they'll go back to doing the same old gripey people they've always been, all right? But I'm going to be faithful, and you're going to be faithful to do what God's called us to do, amen, whether it's teach or speak or witness or give. We're going to be faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So put your big boy pants on, all right? Get over it. Give to the Lord, and let's see what God does in your life. Let's stand together. Father, we love you today. I thank you, Father, for this message today and believe that with all my heart, this is what you want to share. And I ask you, Lord, as we come to this moment, Lord, that our hearts would be open and there'd be a tenderness in our spirits towards you, towards your will, towards your word, towards your ways, Father. We know that your ways are not our ways and we know how our ways can just convolute and mess things up and get so far off base. I ask you, Father, in this moment that we'd have hearts that are tender, teachable, and surrendered. Father, you have never failed your people. But Lord, how much more you desire to do, how much more you would do and could do if we would just learn this act of worship in our lives. With every head bowed just for a moment, if the Lord has spoken about this specific thing today, then respond to him. Say, yes, Lord. It's not something you can do here at the altar. It's something you do at the, at the offering box. By saying, Lord, I, I want you to be faithful today and honor you. You've blessed me. He began to count how much God's blessed us, given us. So whether you're eight, 18 or 88, this lesson's still the same for each of us. You learn this lesson, especially at a young age, and what God can do with your life is supernatural. Learn it now. It's not some rigid tax. 
It's grace and mercy and blessing to be a part of what God's doing. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ. I'll give you an opportunity this morning to slip out from where you are and come and surrender your heart to Jesus. If you're looking for a church home, maybe it's where the Lord's led you. Well, you know where we stand. Stand in Scripture. Say, I want to be a part of the Bible church. Come. Stand on the word with us. Take any one of these men by the hand. They all say, I want to be a part of Believer's Fellowship. Maybe it's just a prayer need you had. Maybe something the Lord's put on your heart. If you do want to come to the altar by yourself, find a place to pray. You're more than welcome. Let's take a moment and surrender to Christ today. Would you come? Let's obey the Lord. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you Just what? 